Yeah, thank you very much, Bart, for the invitation. I will try to explain the better future. That's also one of the subjects, I guess, because we we had already a lot of maybe better futures in the last days, or the question if we actually think can think about um, this anyway. So that's why the title is The Certainty of Uncertainties. Um, and I start actually with this exhibition we did in Venice called Updating Germany. And it was the representation of Germany, and normally it's a best practice show, but we decided that we are looking for these projects for a better future. And that meant that we tried to look for things that people will do in the future, have in the pipeline, short term, long term, and are all with the idea of creating that better future. And I give some examples what that could be. Um, so it was also in, in a couple of different chapters. So one was called the iconic architecture um, show part. And it was maybe this question, the whole subject, of course, was also involved in sustainability in these terms. And um, it was called updating because these updates are little steps built on something that already exists. And if you have an update in computer software, you also know that you get this update and you get some new functions. And sometimes it's a completely new system, so it can be quite radical, but sometimes it's also cosmetic in all levels. And unfortunately, there are very often also new bugs. So it is a step forward, step back thing. And maybe that's also why there is no solution to things. It's, um, it's an open process and it will keep on going to be like this. And um, under, the, under the title of this iconic architecture, you, for example, selected things that are maybe could be called greenwashing, but then they're also symbols of people starting to express something. So it's the beginning of telling a story. For example, this very nice material by um, Alison Ring and Daniel Schwab from Elegant Embellishment, a group in Berlin. It is facade elements that are actually washing the rainwater clean or they clean the air because the, the surface of these objects is maximized and cleans with the reaction of titan dioxide, cleans some dirt out of the air. But the interest, okay, that's a technical factor, but on the other hand, it's a symbolic function as an iconic ecological icon on a building. So it's iconic, this mix mixture of um, e ecology and iconic. And that could be maybe a start on an architectural level to think about better futures. And I will run very quickly to this book. So there are a lot of examples, 100 examples in the book. And then we have, um, we have the landscape and the question how um, the environment on a whole will look tomorrow look like tomorrow and for example there is this big question how will the world look after oil and there are technical solutions of making energy for example these updraft towers that are probably not realized or not in the big scale but it's a nice idea by a German engineer and then there are architects of taking this to an utopian level of thinking okay if we do that we could also maybe build underneath this mega structure that creates energy a new city. So this is a project by Christoph Balib where he kind of um, imagines an utopian idea that has been done in many fold. I mean there are a lot of bubbled cities but it's a mixture of existing technology with a little addition of what could be the next project. And then I bring something for Arno. So I'm, I, one of my, I hope I get the story right. So it's a, um, a project by Arno Brandluber who speaks next and Büro für Konstruktivismus and it's one of my favorite stories. Maybe I enhance it after telling it a lot of times, but it's about uh, um, a small area in Germany where you still excavate uh, coal, open cast mining. And the, the idea is always that um, that's a technical thing. So the, the coal has to get out and it's purely technically organized where to put the earth to take away and so on. And sometimes there are some villages in the way. So you have to move the villages also out of the way and they get very often quite nice replacement cities, but it's a very technical process. And they had the idea that maybe for this, in the case of Elsdorf, you could be, do it a bit differently because only half of the village was really in the in the dangerous zone of being uh, taken away and um, they sort of convinced the mayor that if you do it if you shift the earth a bit differently you could still take out all the coal but you could also create a fantastic landscape and for landscape designers to have like a, a height difference of 400 meters or something is amazing because normally it's not affordable and um, 
So they, I think it's not happening, but the idea was that maybe you um, can create a nice laguna in a lake. Unfortunately, this whole process will take about 100 years. So there is a long time of taking out the earth and then it needs up to 30, 40 years to actually all the water to get in. And then finally, you maybe have this nice landscape. And, but the mayor liked it so much that he already um, bought the website uh, Elsdorf am See, so Elsdorf upon Lake, to maybe be uh, able to market it at some point as a thing. And, and, and this is an example also of updating processes that are maybe unavoidable if you still use coal, but you can also always try to take an extreme long-term view and at least imagine how you could maybe take it to a positive end or wh what you can do with it and not just give it in to some technical um, like, yeah. and, and there, but there are other ideas of um, revolution in, in the, in that's now the eco-technotopia area. So maybe in other ways, um, the, I believe that one of the next steps could be that it's a biological technical innovation. So this is an example by Holwig Kushner architects. They imagine the Metropolis, a city where genetically modified trees that are actually able to gather power and transport water and power in their veins or in their structure and you also can climb the trees so it's all you need as infrastructure for the city will grow over the classic city and be sort of that dramatic future shift. Okay, that is a long-term view I guess but it's also maybe a story you could tell. And then we have other examples that are more about systems, so it's about intelligent structures that perform better. And we take here for example a transportation system, very old thing, sailing, then Via kite surfing, a trendy sport, it is brought back to container ships. You maybe have seen this somewhere, and but that is a symbol also to look back and but make it maybe feasible for um, a better future. And um, but in the end, it's all about responsible consumption, and it's about the consumer and the people who live in there and what they do. And one of my favorite examples is the Familie Bucher. And Familie Bucher uh, became the world championship, uh, world champions in energy saving in 2007 and won the gold medal by the ZTF, I think it was organized, Deutsches Fernsehen. And um, they, they kind of insulated this house and saved 99% of the CO2. And you see the house, it's relatively ugly, um, kind of remaking of this little house. But they were so proud that they afterwards converted also, or they, they changed their jobs and now help other people to do the same to their houses. And the question in the end, that was at the architecture biennale, so the question is a bit, what do the architects wrong? I mean, why are they not asked to do that maybe also in an aesthetic way and, uh, and where's sort of the problem? Why are somehow people so fascinated by this transition and organize it themselves and ask each other and, and so I think the real change begins at home. But after this process, um, we were kind of also doubting ourselves a bit, especially because of this better future question, because how can we know what a better future is? I mean, what is better? And we made this little book, that, well, it was less big at least at the catalog, um, and it has better future question mark on the title, and we asked a lot of experts how they imagine the spatial reality in, I think in, that, in most interviews we told them in 2100. So that's a long term and um, that's completely, nobody knows. And it's completely unscientific to answer this question. And some people also didn't answer it, but some started and it's very nice because then you can also cut them loose from a lot of, um, there is no alternative situations where they are bound to economic technology restrictions so they could actually imagine what could it be like or what would they want it to be. And I won't go into detail, but we, there's a lot of interviews and we have made also illustrations of sometimes quite dark futures and, and negative ideas of uh, dystopian ways of seeing the world, but some of them were actually also extremely positive and came up with um, very interesting ideas. And the question is now that, so we became more and more kind of um, modest in a way, and um, we made another book, it's uh, even smaller. And that's sort of a guideline maybe, it's a bit like this tourist going to Spain uh, or somewhere and having like very basic um, vocabulary to get along. And so what happens if you happen to be in one of those futures 
um, how would you communicate or what would be the proper um, questions to ask and so on. And maybe one thing you see is there is not future, but it's futures, because it's all about there are so many futures. And there is a text in the book about futures and utopias, always in the plural, and the idea that um, there are so many futures ahead of us. We am all of us, we imagine some and we all imagine them as our wishful better futures. And I think that's also what we, when we talked about the master plans and so on, or the master's plans, that is all somebody has an idea of a better future. And that's all, it's all possible, but only one for each individual, but suddenly become the present and then turn immediately into the past. And, but how can you deal with this power of imagination of the future? Because I think that is an extremely driving force for a lot of decisions and also what we just heard from Sonia about the shrinking that, is, that is, was often about turning people's mind about their city and not so much only about the city but how to understand what they do. And so that's just some examples illustrated with photos from actually from Dhaka in Bangladesh where um, we maybe have a very different setup of urban situation and we also did do processes there of asking people in Dhaka about the future. And the in interesting thing is that if you're in a city like Dhaka that is prone to all the problems of climate change and it's overcrowded and poor and so on, they all have fantastic um, imaginations of what a better future could be. And they are not dystopian at all. They have all big hopes into their city. But it's maybe logical because they have it already, while here we are a bit more often depressive about our future. So that's some illustrations of that. And so I think what is crucial about that is that this is an image from Marshall McLuhan's book, um, The Medium is the Massage. Um, and, and you see this rear view mirror in a car and some like old way of transportation. And it, it says there, we look at the present through a rear view mirror we march towards, the, we march backwards into the future. And um, when we, I now do a lot of kind of consultancy work and sometimes for people you know, from the car industry and um, for it's mobility is a big question in the future and they're always, to be convinced of, of thinking about the future and decision making in a different way, they have, this is one example in, in car images that imagine you're driving in a car and the front window is completely um, covered with black tape or it's darkened and you don't see anything anymore. And you look into the rear view mirror, you can quite well drive on the street that is straight by just looking into the mirror because it keeps on going. But as soon as there is a turn or is something big in the street, you have a problem. And in, the, in a way that is a symbol for how a lot of decision making is done by looking into the past and that's of course important. I mean, you have to do research, you have to know about, it, about the status quo, but then to just continue in a way that maybe worked or maybe where you think you could turn that way and then it works, it's kind of dangerous because it probably won't happen like this. And, but nonetheless, I believe that you, create, that you create images is very important. It's just you should not fulfill master plans or utopias or whatever of these ideas of the future with a straight line and then uh, try to fulfill it because that's also why especially political utopias and ideologies very often led to big disasters also because people try to think that is the better future and now we, we do it. And um, if other people have other thoughts, we have to convince them often also with means of um, suppression, etc. And I think that's not the, that's of course not the right way. Um, and, but, but if you now, try to imagine, okay, what, what do we do with all this knowledge of um, being uncertain about the future, doing research, having a very good analysis of the status quo, going to the places. Um, I think it should not be this idea that you say, okay, now we have some outer conditions that are so restrictive that we have no alternatives anymore because also, that's also part of European history that there always have been actually alternatives and that's also maybe the U utopian thinking and I think it's very important to t be able to tell these stories and I think also for architects it is normal actually in design process to think in variations but the variations are all in a kind of corridor of um, wishful thinking of what kind of society or environment the architect would like to have in a way or what the conditions also force onto the process. 
Um, and I think it would be interesting for clients as well as for the designers to be in a process where you could imagine under very different conditions what could be the outcome of a certain um, process. And we did this for a conference in Berlin called Urban Futures 2050. We made a workshop where we had architects but also a lot of other disciplines thinking about in general in that case what could be the future of um, cities in Europe and also knowing that the European city maybe is a role model for a lot of things. But um, we just nonetheless tried to first think about what is, um, unfortunately this is in German but I will translate it, um, we, we kind of imagine what are the key factors that um, will be very influential onto cities. So we talked about mobility cost, if it's going to be cheap to travel and energy is cheap or if that's um, very expensive and limited. And also what do you imagine the society will be? Is it an inclusive society or is it exclusive and will segregate more and more? Or then also you talk about economics on a larger scale, so is, the, is it a boom or is it kind of continuously gradually going down? Then yeah, and you talk about also locally about um, communities, do they have money to actually do something or are they just following um, their like, dead and they don't have a chance to actually be active? And then you also imagine if like, the model of um, living well is based upon money in the end, it's the, is, it, is it the, the Bruttoinlandsprodukt or is it another form of um, well-being where other arguments are actually counting more? And of course also about urban lifestyle, is it individualistic or is it more family oriented? And also do you imagine the future to be very dense or is it an urban sprawl? And of course these factors are all I mean, they're happening in the, at the same time. It's not uh, like also maybe segregated in different spaces, but you can try to imagine a situation where you combine them wildly and in extreme outcomes. And we did this, and one of my favorite combinations, for example, this one called Energy Ego Trip Towns, where you have very low cost mobility because somehow you solved the energy problem maybe by harvesting energy in the landscape and, but you have a very individualistic lifestyle and you have a very dense urban area where you live because these energy harvesting points are not equally distributed only at some places. Or we have other one, the lovely neighbor for example, is one where mobility cost is extremely high. Um, but the, like the, the, civil, like the civil organization of society is very strong and people live together and take care of each other and they live in a very dense urban area or what we called urban walking villages. It's, a, it's also an area where mobility cost is very high and also people work together but it's a complete urban sprawl where people are distributed all over the landscape and it's not dense anymore. And in this process that well, I think in, in Holland, for example, it's also quite common to talk about these kind of ideas as a scenario. It's a, that's, a, for example, a tradition that is, comes from military um, theory. Hermann Kahn, an American, I don't know what he was, but an inventor, he, um, he founded this theory and he, I think he found then Rand Corporation and it was very much based on military and on the idea of mutual extinction by nuclear weapons and to imagine actually this unimaginable and what, what could be and how should you deal with the problem and we try to demilitarize it a bit and also we take it out of this very number-based um, realm and bring it more to storytelling and it's, so it's very quality-based. And in groups, people, and I think architects could do that also very well, also especially in education, can learn to test their ideas under very different conditions by imagining, in this case, to live in 2050 under these new parameters and write some kind of novel and also draw drawings or build models. There's a bit of a question of how much time you have and how the process is organized, but it works quite well. And in this case, it's the, the love the neighbor um, story. Um, and it's a, it's a story where the 21st century didn't become the century of the cities, or at least not for Europe, because somehow this whole idea failed. The oil production was shrinking drastically after 2030 
and especially European cities were struck hard because they were too old and they were not really they couldn't cope with it. They were they didn't expect it, and um, and the, the kind of economic forces from other parts of the world were dragging them down. And so all over Europe, you have had a. The, the civic city society was going down. But then there were some cities like Phoenix from Ashes that came up and decided, well, well, we're living together and we can create our own society and take care of our products locally. And um, even though Europe wasn't important in the world anymore, some of these cities made it. And then these lovely neighbor city, I mean, it's of course romantic and it's a bit overdone, but it's important maybe to test um, uh, decisions. Um, we have, we have there, for example, is a garden sweeper. That's all these illustrations, uh, new forms of businesses. So people that voluntarily ca take care of the public realm and um, live in this, after the recession, they live in this uh, local area and have new forms of economy. That, um, for example, the people who own the land give it also to this community and, and create maybe a new form of living. And it's, uh, well, it's a long text. You can, I can also, it's downloadable and readable. And then there's another opportunity with completely different sets of um, starting points. So it's the aforementioned energy trip town. Where, okay, it's great. You have so much energy that you can take your motorcycle and ride around the city all the time and it doesn't really matter anymore. But then we realize that there is not only infinite yes, but there is also infinite um, um, scarcity in a way. And because then there are other resources that are scarce, for example, they, in this case, they're not able to store the energy they produce, so they just have to waste it and um, because they have a lot of other materials they don't have, and also because water is scarce, they can only live in certain spots. And um, also it's a social scarcity because of this kind of not taking, like using up this all this energy is maybe a very um, tough society, and uh, it's described in this text how people also are not, so, not treating each other so well anymore. So, and if you, and another example, it's, uh, it's, so it's clear that these kind of um, predictions, well, we don't know. Uh, nobody can tell the future. And this is two famous kind of quotes, or at least the first one is famous, of um, how it can com go completely the other direction. And for Berlin, we also did these tests where we, th there is a bit of a different process where we kind of um, reduced the future of Berlin into two things, and if one is the, the myth of Berlin as being this kind of uh, after the war came down or even before, like special situation city, and uh, that will live on, or will that die out and actually Berlin becomes a normal big city like others? And then the other one is this, it's the bit based on migration, and it's if that is a, leads to some kind of re-fundamentalization re -fund or if it's more like a, it's normal and it really becomes a multicultural or mixed society. And, and then you can also tell these stories of maybe imagining a Berlin that uh, is called the fundamentalicities, so a city where um, it's completely segregated and um, there it's more based on personal interests, not only on religious or ethnic interests, but maybe it's also on hobbies. So some are the mountain climbers that are then more connected to some mountain in the Alps and some in North America, and they not talk to their neighbors anymore. And it's really based on locality in the terms of uh, we sharing one common interest and we live together and we are very well connected in the world, but it's not an urban fabric anymore. And of course, it can be also technology based. So there's some Apple lovers and some other things. And I mean, I, and also to make it clear, this is all not only, that's not invented by me. So this is uh, always people from, in that case, Berlin or from variation of expert groups and also from really local people that um, imagine how, what the outcome could be. And this is nice. It's called Think Tankstelle in Berlin. Um, that's maybe a positive idea. So Berlin stays very open and also this open in both ways, so about migration as well as also the myth. 
and it creates a lot of ideas that are um, not locally used because the economy didn't keep up with that. So it's not Germany that actually uses these ideas, but they are maybe made into products somewhere in China, but, the, um, but this local creativity stayed in Berlin. And um, people test out a lot of things and you see this, all these temporary structures of architecture. And so that could also be one of the future visions. And there are two more, like Blade Runner is more like a dystopian vision or um, Berlin Incorporated, where it became actually a normal city that is integrated into a network of global cities and um, works economically intensively. So I think that th this is also all like imagine images of a far distant fantasy um, world, but it's all based on very precise um, analysis of the status, status quo in the beginning and then thinking what are the key factors that are maybe changing it and then exaggerating a lot. And now if you have these fantasies, you can try to come back to the everyday decisions and test out where your everyday decisions might lead to. So you analyze what is good about all these images, what is not so good. And from that you have like some general advices. And then even very banal decisions become less based on the wishful thinking idea of one ideology, but maybe become robust, um, based on robust um, decisions or dis like ideas that you avoid or voluntarily push some of these imaginations. And I, I could imagine that this maybe helps, and I think it's a bit of a risk because we heard a lot of criticism in a way of ideas so far, but then it's still necessary maybe to have a mechanism of um, being able to make new ideas and test them through, and this kind of process could hopefully help. Thank you very much.